Hi everyone, welcome back. A another year, another year's worth of worth of live streams. Firstly, thanks to everyone that joined us last year. Um, yeah, it was interesting. We started off these live streams. Me and Spence had never done them before, um, and now it's uh, it's a part of the week we really look forward to when we get around to doing them. So, as always, um, let us know if everything's set up correctly, if our audio's all well balanced, that we're both the same sort of volumes, and if we've got any technical issues, you're our only feedback. It's quite odd on our side because we just don't get anything back in return. So, yeah. So, happy to be back again, Spence. Can't wait to be back on a live stream. This is exciting. I'm excited to see what you've got for us this week, and uh, excited to to engage with the uh, with uh, the watchers over the chat. Yeah. Have we got any of the regulars on? Uh, no chance yet. Oh, Klaus, Klaus, Michael. Happy New Year to you too, sir. Happy New Year, Klaus. You too. So as always, let us know in the chat what's going on. How's, uh, how's Fusion going for you so far, 2021? Uh, I'd love to hear what, what you've been using Fusion for, what you've, what you've been designing, what you've been making. And uh, as we go along the live stream, any comments for, for Rich uh, or any questions, please let us know in the Spencer chat. Spencer loves to try and catch me out. Yeah, the harder the questions, the better, for sure. No, please be kind to me. It's I'm still fragile in this new year. How are you finding uh, 2021 so far, Rich? Uh, busy, busy. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. Really enjoying it. We've got got a lot of stuff we're working on at the moment. Some of the stuff we can share. Uh, some of the stuff we can't yet. So it's 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 been good. Um, I hope everyone out there has watched the video that I posted on how to update your toolware using your probe. That had uh, most of my time for the first couple of weeks we were back. So yeah, and then I can't wait to show what I've been working on this week as well, which I'll show in this live stream. Audio sounds fine. Ah, apparently. brilliant. Thank Cheers for whoever that Klaus. was. Klaus again. Cheers, Klaus. Hero of the hour. We need you on these calls. We'd be nothing without you. How are we looking, Spence? How many people on so far? Uh, we've, it's, we've got a handful. handful. Let us know in the, in the chat where you're based, where, yeah. where you're watching from. Let's try to get some new places. Uh, we had a, a variety of places last year, but let's try to take up a few more on the old world map. Yeah, definitely. You know, Spencer likes to travel. We're not doing any travelling at the moment. We'd normally be out doing things like Fusion Academy, different things like that. So uh, we'd really, really enjoy um, knowing where people are from. So we feel like we've at least done a little bit of travelling this year. Absolutely. Cool. Perfect. Right, let's crack into this. Again, please let's get let us into know it. about any issues you see. So... What I'm going to be talking about today is how to design bespoke fixturing. So this is actually going to be more of a design tutorial than it is a cam tutorial. But I'm more just going to be talking about some of the things that I consider when I'm looking at holding the parts um, and how I do it. Uh, there's going to be very little actually st stuff in the software. This is more going to be a personal tutorial. Um, we've said part one. I'm hopefully going to end up making this uh, maybe next week or the week after. We'll do a live stream then, and then we'll make the parts. So we want to just do a little series. That's what we're going to try and do this year, is take one part and sort of show you the steps we go from initial concepts to actually making it and holding it in our hands. So I do a lot of work with a customer. Um, he makes bike pedals. Um, if you're watching, hi, Phil. Um, this is one of the parts of a pedal. It's quite small, really difficult to hold. I mean, if we have a quick look at um, this here, that's only five millimeters. So it's it's not big at all. So it's quite difficult to hold. It's got two sides to it, as you can imagine. So we do our first milling up from this side. We then come all the way down and we machine and then we flip it over. So you can see, it, I'm not gonna go through all the cam parts of it. You've all seen me do that far too often. We'll be covering that in some, some later live streams how we're actually going to go about machining this so if i want to hold this now um the way that uh phil and myself have been doing this previously is using a, a just a, a vice with serrated jaws to hold on the raw billet we get square billets in that are 90 mil by 12.5 by 12.5 we grab those with the serrated jaws of the vice we then machine the first side and then flip it over into some machined um, aluminium or aluminium soft jaws, which we just grab effective, effectively this profile here and then we clamp 
against that profile there. So that's how we machine the second side of this. Um, there we go. So, we have recently, myself and Phil, been talking, and he's changed his setup quite seriously. Before, he had a, a five-axis trunnion on his Hass, and he made one pedal at a time. Um, business was going well. His orders were cropping up. So what we looked at is a setup where we could get more than one pedal on. So how gorgeous is that setup? You can see here the power of fusion. We've done all these designs. We've looked at how we can uh, orientate. So we actually worked on this before Christmas. So before we actually placed the order for this quite expensive kit, we knew that we could make it work because of fusion showing how things were gonna manipulate, how it was all gonna to go together, how it was gonna rotate, if there were gonna be any collisions. So really useful, you can spend your time here before you actually you know, uh, buy the equipment itself. But the problem is, is that little component then fits across there. Now, although there looks like there's loads of room here on this side, on the, on the spindle, uh, there's some big casings and some coolant nozzles. Doesn't leave you much room over here. I know it looks like there's a lot, but there really isn't a lot of room over here when you get down to it. So what we needed to do is look at this empty station that we've got here on this chick system. Uh, you can get many trunnion systems like this. We just happen to use chick for this example. Um, you can get a machinable face plate so basically it's a big slug of aluminium that bolts onto there and then you can actually start machining it and um, put your own bespoke fixturing on so it's a fixture on a fixture if you get what i mean how are we getting on spence looking good looking good we've got uh austin from india on the call sean from outer lancashire abo from saudi mm -hmm. uh, Crivo, virginia beach uh Karls, germany and uh, the the star of the show, Pembry. Is, Pembry uh, here. Online. Very are. nice. Very nice. Okay. So anyway, enough about that. So this is this is what we've got now. We've got that chip face plate. So how do I go about thinking about making a bespoke fixture for this? Well, it's quite. It's a very chicken and egg process, if I'm honest, because how you machine the part defines how you hold it but how you hold it defines how you machine it. So imagine if I'm, let's use some planes here to demonstrate. If, I've, if I'm holding it and I've got a clamp there, well, I can only machine down as far as my clamp is. So my clamping is defining how I machine it, but then how I machine it's defining how I clamp it. So it's a little bit difficult. And you, you've got to, the, what I'm basically saying is you've got to do lots of iterations. So the first thing that I looked at was this and again what I'm showing here this is exactly what I do I don't worry about making a perfect design um, I just want to see how things are going to fit we really needed to get eight of these because there's four traction rails per pedal we're making two pedals per cycle so we need eight traction rails there's eight traction rails that need two operations so I need enough space to put 16 of those little parts on the faceplate. Does all my, my maths make sense there, Spencer? I believe so. <laughs> cool, brilliant. It's only basic times table, so hopefully I'm correct <laughs> on that. Um, so this is what I first came up with, and you can see that's my halfway point. So I thought that they're the, roughly the same size, op 10, op 20. I don't machine too much off. So I need to fit eight on half, eight on the other half. You can see I've only fitted six on there. An interesting thing I wanted to show you though is these are the clamps that um, I want to be using. They're called pit bull clamps that they push down and across. They're really good in putting that downwards motion and pressing against a, a, a datum face as well. But you can see I've actually staggered the parts to get the clamps side by side and try and nest them in a little bit together. I thought that was quite clever, trying to nest the clamps and stagger the parts. Um, but even with that method, I could still only get six clamps together. So that still wasn't going to work. I then looked at a different method. Uh, let's go to that one there. Where I looked at, can I do it this way instead? So can I put the clamps on and use these smaller grippers? So what I would do if I were you out there designing a fixture is look for any company. I mean, I've just got a Wixrod catalogue. It was one that was lying around at work. And it's just got all the different 
fixture eyeing items in. I'm old and I like to sit and look through a, look through a catalogue, or you can look through the online catalogues. But just sit down, look through any catalogue for inspiration. It's quite interesting sometimes. You see things and go, ah, I didn't think of that. If I did it like that, then this would change things. And that's exactly what happened with these smaller gripper pads. Didn't know they existed. I saw them in the book and went, ah, that's it. I think I can use those. So you can see here that they're the serrated bits holding against the raw material. I'm going to machine the top side there, and then I'm going to machine the second side there. But again, count them up. There's only six um, finished parts on that fixture. I need to get eight. So having a quick look, we found that they do a wider faceplate. So the same size, but even wider now. I've turned the parts 90 degrees, and this is what I've come up with. So you can see here the design I've got. I've turned these components off just so you can see what's going on. And this was the design that I'm pretty well settled on now. So my top tip for anyone out there doing fixture design would be don't be too precious about the design. I mean, if you have a quick look at these, I bet there's, no, there's no alarms, but you know, it's not very good modeling practice. The parts are just sat there. I can drag them around. They're not jointed properly. But just don't worry about it. Just quickly start arranging your parts on, have a look at what space you've got to play with, and then you probably end up completely redoing the design afterwards when you know how you want to orientate these. So this is what I'm pretty well settled on now, so I'm spending a lot more time in getting this right. So let's have a quick look at some of the aspects of this. Now, I tend to like to work from left to right, just like to, there's no rule against it. Um, and again, I, I like to have it a bit more segregated. So I could have had an op 10, an op 20, an op 10, an op 20. So you just flip the part over from one to the other. I personally just chose to have them this way. There's no real reason for it, don't, don't worry. The big advantage of this though, is I can actually have my face mill cutter run across the whole pack of the parts rather than worrying that it's uh, you're doing a little bit of the one and then a little bit of the other the face milk can just run across the pack of the parts saves a little bit of time as well so with your fixtures the big things you want to think about how many parts can you get on there and how to hold them so that's what we're looking at in a second we've already covered the how many parts we'll look at how to hold them the next one is um, the datum faces so what do you want to push against you got to think of the person that's going to have to be loading and unloading them. You know, you can get these clamps in all shapes and sizes. Some of you that might have seen the live stream before Christmas um, with the laptop stands and those expanding clamps, they used a one and a half mil Allen key. My heart skipped to beat every time I tighten those up thinking, am I going to strip the thread here? So you're going for nice, big, chunky things. Um, this needs to last a lifetime, this does. So the stronger, the better. Um, we used to, the place I used to work, there used to be a guy called um, James or Jim, we used to call him. And we used to say, is it Jim proof? He was very heavy handed. He liked to tighten everything up with, a, with a, a hammer on the end of the Allen key. So we looked at it and said, is that Jim proof? Will he be able to break it? Sorry if you're watching, Jim. Um, so what we've got here is, is that another big consideration actually is Swarf. Now, Swarf will get everywhere. So there are two schools of thought. The one is to have everything right, everything on a flat base. So when you take everything off, you can easily blow the swarf around. Uh, so blow the swarf off, not around. Or it's to have everything sunk into pockets that have very minimal gaps around them. And then the swarf hopefully won't get into those gaps. We're not going to argue today on which one's right or which one's wrong. You've just got to choose what do you want for your application. Because I know that we have quite large swarf, um, in this scenario, um, effectively, I, I don't mind to have the gaps. It's going to be absolutely fine. We have the gaps there and it will all work okay. So, brilliant. Let's have a quick look at some of the bespoke aspects of this fixture. So, you can see I'm holding this raw blank of material here now. This is the raw blank of material. It's going to date them, first of all, on the bottom. So what you can actually see here is there's a gap on the bottom. I'm going to get little studs that actually sit on the bottom and raise up. For a starter, that means if there is a tiny bit of swarf underneath these parts, it's got somewhere to go. 
So if there's a tiny bit of swarf underneath that I haven't managed to clean off, it can actually sit there in the void because there'll be a little stud that will just sit here and hold the part off that bottom plane. So again, haven't modeled it yet. I'm still working on this. I was just too excited to show you all. So there's going to be some little studs on there. That's what I would think of my datum A, my sort of main face it's going to go down onto. Now my datum B in my head. I come from a metrologist background, so I think A, B, and C from my datums. Datum B is this face edge here, which is this one we see here. So it's going to push down. It's going to push against that edge. And then it's going to push into these serrated teeth by this pit bull clamp here. If you haven't seen these pit bull clamps before, various companies make them, um, but they've all got the same sort of concept. What they do is, effectively, this acts as a pivot point at the back. And as you screw it down again, it, it sort of comes forwards and pushes down and clamps at the same time. That's what those are like. Spence, shall I stop talking for a minute? Have you got any... Because uh, you know me, I just like to talk for an hour non-stop. You were on a roll, Rich. I didn't want to uh, to interject, but um, no. To be honest, we've got uh, a few more joined. Gel from the Philippines, uh, Andrew from Texas, uh, and we had uh, Vizak. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, uh, but he asked where he could get some uh, uh, some video material on learning content on um, getting started with Fusion. So I pointed him to the. Uh, Self-learning, self-paced self, learning. Exactly right. The self-paced learning and, and links in the chat. Um, we had a question from Michael who's asking, what is the book with hardware parts? Is there one that is better than the others? I, I'm i probably not the one to ask for that. I'm quite lazy. Um, and I, I know of a company called Wixrod. There are lots of others. There's um, a company called First MTA that I know. There's, there's too many to mention out there, um, but use any and all of them. Um, just Google um, work holding fixturing components um, and see see what's out there that you like, really. Like I said, with those pit bull clamps, I've seen four or five companies do their own variants. The same as those serrated grippers. Um, you'll probably find different people do a different size, maybe. And you think, ah, well, that size actually is better fitted for my application than that one. Or some of the grippers... Um, uh, mounted on the front with a bolt, some of them mounted on the side with a bolt. It'll just be finding what you've got. The same as everything, I would have a couple of different books from different people because I'll probably have slightly different um, variants of the same sort of products. Um, and you might just find that is, is a, you know, giving you a bit more range and opportunity for different things on there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Andrew's saying he likes the McMaster. Yeah, uh, the master book. We have a question about the pitbull clamps, which go for it. Um, do you find that they mar the side surfaces of the parts? Ah, okay, all? okay. So there's again, the company that I'm using have three types. This one is called a blunt edge. So as you can see there, there isn't a sharp face on that. Um, they do another type, which is called a knife edge, which, as you'd expect, is a knifed edge, and then they do a brass blunt edge as well which not only means you can actually machine them to a contour but they're less likely to mark the parts um i mean i've got serrated edges here so i want it to mark the part i want it to dig and bite in we might use knife edge here um i've got blunt edge ones on just because that was my model and it just worked for all of them but it won't really make any difference on the cad side of things they're the same size it's just one of them's blunt one of them's got a knife um, and then on here again, if you get it right and it's flat on flat, then you should be okay. I mean, the brilliant thing here is you want to think of the way that the loading is going to happen on this part. 90% of the loading on this part is going to be a very small amount of axial and then a bit of down on the, um, the axis of the cutter as well. So it, this is going to be held quite firmly by the contour of the soft jaw portion, we're not gonna need much load on here. So what I am gonna say, um, again, jumping the gun slightly, is we will definitely be using a torque wrench and we'll actually be doing some trials where we'll test out different torques of what we should be using to hold these parts down. And we'll be seeing then the effects they have on marking the parts. So, you know, on this side, 
I want to use a lot of, of, of torque. We're doing a lot of heavy roughing, heavy facing. On this side, not so much. Hopefully that answers that one, Spence. I think so. Well, I understood it. If you didn't understand it, let us know in the chat and uh, we'll, 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 we'll try again for you. Brilliant. No more yeah. questions at the moment, Rick, so uh, back to you. I can carry on now. No, please, that was honestly a joke. Ask me questions as much as you can. Yeah. So what I'm going to look at here is the clearance around this part. So what you can see here, there's a gap on the sides. There's no gap there because it's my datum edge. Um, if you look at this one, there's a gap there and there's no gap there. This is for two reasons. One, you want to get the thing in and out so it can't be size for size or else you'd never get it in and out quickly. You know, you've got to think when you're doing this, potentially your doors are open on the machine. When your doors are open, you're not making money. So you want to make sure that you can change these parts as quick as possible. So that gap on there, um, again, let's just have a quick look at that. Um, I've gone for half a mil. The brilliant thing about that half a mil is I can always make it bigger. I can't make it any smaller. If I go for two mil and it was a really sloppy fit, um, then I can't make it any smaller. I've gone for half a mil. If I don't like it, I can, eat, I can always take some material back out of that. Um, and then I've got these corners. Here. Of course, we all know that with a round tool, you can't make square corners. There will always be a corner radius. So what we're going to do here is pre-drill these corners out. Because they need to be a sharp corner going into there. And you also want to... Excuse me. You want to leave a bit of room in case there's a burr on the edge. So the burr doesn't actually interfere with the way it locates. I've seen that before. If there's a burr on the edge of a saw cut billet and you try and push it into a corner, the burr holds it off. Um, I do a lot of woodwork as a hobby, and you get exactly the same with woodwork. If you use a chop saw, chop down, on the one side of the blade, you tend to throw a burr, depending on what you're cutting in the blades. Um, if you then push that against something in a jig, that actually can cause you problems. So this little re relief here, which will be a drilled hole in first, stops that. Let's have a look at how I constructed that, because it's quite interesting. Well, I think it's interesting. Um, I'm going to make a new sketch actually so you can see what I do from, from the start. Let's go for it. So we're going to quickly do a new sketch on here. So how did I make up that? Um, I'm going to hit P for project. If you don't know that hotkey, P for project, it's absolutely brilliant. And I'm just going to project this top face that we've got there. This has turned into a modelling tutorial rather than a cam tutorial, Spence. It is oh, useful nonetheless there, Rich. Okay, I'm just going to thank you very much. I'm just going to try and rebuild this uh, this rectangle because I've suddenly thought it's not going to work because the rectangle doesn't exist anymore. I've already chopped the corners off. So let's let's um, put the geometry back in there. I'm hitting L for line. If you didn't know those shortcuts, another nice shortcut for you. I'm going to use a coincident constraint to put that line on that point. Then I'm going to hit T for trim and I'm going to take out those bits there. So I've just reconstructed the rectangle that I originally designed. Now I want to put in my circle for my pre-drill. Now you can be lazy and you can just do that, put it on the circle. 3.3 um, is a drill that I've got in our machine that I know I'm going to be using. So you could do that. But you see here you've actually got a really large area of material that, that doesn't need to be removed. You only need to remove as little as possible to allow um, the, the, the whatever cutter you use to go in to have a bit of an area to, to go around. So what I do is I do a line coming out. I then hit D for dimension. I grab the dimension of that. I know it's 90 degrees, but bear with me because, for example, over over here, when I had to do it, it wasn't 90 degrees. So that's why I always grab um, the dimension there, just in case it's not 90. I then dimension that, and if you don't know you can do this, you can click on the dimension, and I'm gonna just divide it by two. So I know now that line is exactly in the midpoint of the other two lines. I'm gonna hit C for circle, start the center of the circle there, and then make the circle finish just on that point. Hit D for dimension. 
I know I said 3.2 earlier, but I'm going to make it 4 because it will jump straight on top of the other one. And you can see now that I've got that circle precisely now, so it removes the minimum amount of material, material possible, which means that I've got the maximum amount of material as a datum edge as possible, while still um, actually making sure it does the job properly. Hopefully that made sense, everyone. Um, there's many ways of doing that. That's the way I do it in fixtures to try and make sure that I've got the most amount of material left on that data edge as possible. So we look here at what we've got. We can see that the corner isn't going to be fouled with a burr. And then when the cutter comes in and goes down there and up there in like a 2D contour pass, for example, the radius left by the radius of the cutter it doesn't exist anymore because I've pre-drilled out those corners. Um, me and Spencer found an interesting thing on the forum the other day. In woodworking, it's called, was it dog bone fillets? That's correct, sir. Yeah, dog That's bone. That's effectively like a dog bone fillet. It's it's basically what what's the pre-drill that does this, the minimum amount of unwanted metal removal. So that's what we've got here. Again, we've got the data mesh there. We've got the clearance all the way around the part, and then we can lift that in and out. Let's now move on to our op twenties. So this is these are our op twenties over here. What we've got here, we're going to date them on the bottom. Of course, that's normally where you do date them is fl flat on the bottom edge. You can see the sun's come out in sunny house in here, and it's coming straight from our blinds and blinding me. Um, so we've got the date edge at the bottom, which is my datum A in my head. The next datum, now this is where it gets interesting, where we could debate this all day long. So what we've got here, of course, is the perfect scenario. The part is exactly the right size. So I could cut the pocket out. Thankfully, this is a really nice tapered wedge shape. So, of course, if it goes up at the moment on the screen, it actually becomes really loose in the fixture, which helps me get the part in and out. But, of course, if this part is slightly smaller, then actually... It's not going to clamp on these edges at all because of the fact that they're tapered. If the distance between them is less, then it's going to wobble back to front. So I could have cut this edge further out to allow for that, to make sure it always datumed on those two edges. However, what I didn't want to risk there is all of the force of this clamp being on those edges rather than on this big back edge over there. So I've made a judgment call that I'm happy that if that part is slightly smaller than what it should be, everything in the world's got a tolerance, nothing's made, you know, nanometer perfect. Um, if that is smaller, then yes, there will be a bit of side-to-side -side play, but it's going to be a mount that I'm going to be, you know, accepting. You know, I could potentially do some inspection on the OP10s with my spindle-mounted probe to make sure that that uh, variation is within... My acceptable allowance if it's too big of course what's going to happen there is it's going to do exactly what i didn't want to happen and it's going to push this part up and it's actually going to come away from this edge there so again i need to think again i'm still designing this fixture it's not finished yet maybe i'll look at putting a bit of relief on on maybe the one side because this is over constrained in all fairness the more i'm talking to you the more i'm thinking i need to change this um this is quite over constrained because it's going to wedge itself into that pocket what i'll probably do after this call now you've got me thinking about this is i'll probably relieve this side out quite a bit so when we put these in we can push it up this way and across that way so it's going to go flat down and then i can push it diagonally into this corner and it can date them off there and there. That's what I'm doing. I've decided it's going to happen, Spence. We're going to take out a bit more of that corner to give us the thing. Because if that part's bigger or smaller, then it's going to affect the way it sits in that wedge. So again, you can see fixture design is a massive iterative process. Even talking to you now, I've convinced myself that I'm not happy with the way that that sits. Things that I always say on fixtures, write on as much detail as you can. Um, I used to set fixtures up, and it's absolutely horrible when you think, especially when you get a square fixture, well, which way is X, which way is Y, I don't know. Um, put on the G offset that you plan on programming on Fusion. 
So we've used all G54, 55, 56, 57, 58, and 59. Um, but the, the Haas that we'll be using on this and other Fanex and different things as well have additional offsets that you can do G154, P1. I think you got to P155, so you can get 155 additional offsets on there. Um, what job's it for? And then most importantly, a dataming hole. So when I load this onto the machine, I will probe or use a dial test indicator. I will set up off that hole there. Because without that there, you're left to the sides of the block. And to be honest, that's not a very good method of doing it. The sides of the block aren't normally what is precisionly fitted um, to, in this case, there's these special interfaces on the bottom. Um, and they're what's going to be doing the work and, and, and fitting everything in in a repeatable location. So you take these off and put them back on, they should be repeatable there. But that's the really important thing. Give yourself a nice, easy thing to actually date them off. Again, do I do that positive or do I do it negative? Um, that is going to fill up with swarf. It is. And it's going to be annoying. If I do it positive my knuckles are going to catch it. I can feel them. I can feel them disappearing on me already. So I've gone for a negative one there. It's all about weighing up the pros and the cons. Do you want it to be... Again, if you had all this as standing proud, you'd be catching your fingers on these serrated clamps. You'd be catching them on these pit bull clamps. But yes, the swarf would be easier to blow off the bed because it's one big flat bed. I've gone to recess everything in because it looks a bit nicer in my opinion. Um, and also, I'm just fed up of having cuts on my hands all the time. So yeah, how are we doing on the questions, Spence? We haven't had that many. Uh, we'd love to see a few more questions come through. Um, I mean, people are loving it, Rich. Uh, Michael Lamb, again, mm -hmm. apologies if I, if I uh, said your name wrong, thinks it's just brilliant, Rich. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Sounds thanks. like you're making his day. Um, Cheers, Michael. Again, if one person out there is enjoying this, I consider it job done. So, brilliant. I can, I can, I can sleep a happy man tonight. Absolutely. Any questions for Rich, though? If, he, if he's going too quick, if he's going too slow, if, you've, uh, if you don't understand something, please let us know in the chat. I'll raise all of the questions to, to Richard and he can answer him live on, on, on the yeah. video. So. Again, this is part one. Uh, we really want to make this a, a quick series where we'll be showing more and more on this. We want to try and um, machine it and then actually machine the parts as well. Um, you know, I really like to try and practice what we preach um, and do that. I'm going to be really unprofessional and I'm going to shut these blinds because I can't see a thing. Oh, there we go. You You're showing off it? there, Rich. It's, uh, it's <laughs> raining here. Is it? it has has been for the past two and a half days. I hope you're all right with some with the uh, the floods up north, Spence. I hope you're okay with that. Everything's and, fine for me. Hope everyone watching is okay it. too. Yeah, hopefully everyone. It's uh, never a nice thing with and uh, get flooding in the UK. But anyway, so we've talked about some of the really important things. Quick recap on there. Don't do a perfect design. Well, you can if you want, but try not to do a perfect design to start with. I showed you two of the designs. Um, you know, you got to look like that was my piece of paper that I scrolled on last night when I tried to work out could I get the parts on. Um, that was that was where my design started from. Um, that was when I looked at, oh, if I can get the left and right to right around, I looked to see the heights on the fixture to work out how low to hold it. All sorts of things. You just got to. Be very iterative. Look at what's going on. Think about, is that going to work? Yes or no? And then build upon that. Um, don't be too precious to start with. So that was one thing actually I, I didn't mention. Is So on here, how did I know the depth that I could clamp on? So of course, you always want to clamp on as much as possible. So this is our part. Let's do a quick sketch on that surface there. And the, the blocks that we buy in are 90 millimeters long by 12.5. It's a standard size. Um, and then, so what I looked at now is if I go for half a millimeter on there, so there's half a millimeter there, that's effectively the, um, the amount of material I want to machine off the top. How much have I got here? So let me just project. And now let me dimension. 
So I've got five millimeters there. It looks loads, doesn't it? But it's not. Uh, let's project that face. And let's quickly measure that. And let's quickly go on there and there. We've got two millimeters there. So of course I've got to think that my cutter, when I do my profile roughing off, when I go around this part, my cutter is going to come down to about there. I want to make my cutter overcut that by about half a millimetre. Let's have a look at what I've got there. I've got 6.5. Guess what I went for? 6 millimetres. So my, my clamping here, you've got to love all my little sketches everywhere. My clamps effectively now are 6 millimetres up. So my tool is going to come down to here. My clamp is going to be up to there. And I'm going to have half a millimetre spare between the bottom of my tool and the top of my clamp and I'm happy with that from there. So that's what I did, that's how I worked out. I looked at what was the deepest position of any tool in OP10 and then that tells you your clamping position because of course you don't want to be taking the tops off your clamps. So that was how I worked out that one. So let's go back under there. That's what I did. Again I'm going to put these little studs on the bottom um, to try and lift it off. So again, quick recap before we finish off, so get your questions in quick, is you've got to think about how many parts do you want to get in your envelope. You've then got to think about loading and unloading. You don't want clamps all over the place. You've got to think now, this is quite a nice methodical process that I can go to to unload these. I can unload all my OP20s, put those to the side, quickly clean off the swarf. I can then unclamp all my op 10s put those into my op 20s clamp them up clean off the swarf on the op 10 side and then put all my fresh billets in you don't want to be having to like rest parts on the side of your bed while you take off another part you want to be able to take parts off and then move everything over one station at a time um once i've thought about that i'm then going to look at the clearances and dataming that i need so again datum one datum two, datum three. That's where I'm gonna push down, across, and up to. That's how I think about it. Your biggest one's normally down flat, just the way parts are naturally orientated, and then you're gonna go across and against something. Then physically, how am I gonna hold it? What's gonna bite into it? Um, and where do those need to be positioned? Again, they're gonna be sitting just there and clamping against those. Um, three is the magic number. Um, anything more than three, one of them will never touch. You've got to think, if you have a, a four-legged um, stool and you put a coin under one of the feet, your stool now rocks around. If you have a three-legged stool, like a tripod, and something goes underneath one of them, you've still got a stable base to go on. Um, that's why milkmaid stools are three-legged, not four-legged, Spencer. I hope you knew that one. Every day is a school day, Rich. <laughs> Every day is a school day. Yeah, um, so three datums is always good because it means that they can equally distribute and one of them is not going to be pushing off another one. Don't over-constrain your designs like I've done here in Op20. So learn from my mistakes, please. Save you a bit of time. Again... Once you're happy with that, put yourself a nice datum on the part and try and mill in using the trace toolpath as much information as you can. The person setting it, be it you or be it someone else, will thank you endlessly. And finally, swarf is our enemy. Try and think about where is it going to go. I mean, again, it's going to be a real problem because swarf's going to be gathering in this back edge. I'm still wondering what I can do here. I'm not sure. I'll keep you posted on that one and I'll see how it goes. It might just be a fact that Swarf's going to gather there and I'm going to have to clean it out. But we need to see what happens on this. If I, again, remove lots more material, we might end up with a scenario, again, where I'm catching my fingers on everything. The problem is these are really tiny parts, so they do need to be sunk down into the bed rather than just floating around on the top. Um, I hope you found this useful. Um, I hope the tips have been useful. Again, I'm going to be doing a series on this with Spencer. We're really looking forward to it. We're going to make the fixture. We're going to make the parts. We're going to look at what we've done wrong, what we've done right. Um, I definitely don't profess myself to be a, an industrial fixture designer. Um, I can just about get by. 
hope this has been useful everyone we really appreciate you joining in if you're watching this now or watching it later put some comments uh, below um, we'd love to hear what, what you think about the idea that this little serious thing that we're going on um, and we look forward to the next couple of weeks with you yeah thanks for joining everybody if you like the video give it a like YouTube loves that and uh, if you haven't already subscribe and if you hit that little bell icon after you've subscribed, you'll be notified of every live stream, every video that uploads, and you'll never miss a thing. Yep, I know. Doesn't that sound brilliant? But yeah, everyone, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. We look forward to the next um, couple of weeks with you and the, the rest of however long that they let us keep doing this for. I can't Bring believe on. no one's kicked us off so far. Bring on 2021 live streams. That's what I say. Thanks, Rich. Yeah. Appreciate Cheers, it. Cheers, everyone. Really appreciate your time. Speak to you soon. Bye.